This presentation will focus on non-herbicide weed management strategies for the control of smooth and red root pigweed in specialty crops. I am Meredith Melendez, County Agricultural Agent with Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Mercer County. I am joined by Terry Bensicone, our Extension Specialty Crop Weed Specialist. Thanks for joining me today, Terry. You're very welcome, Meredith. Hello, everyone. Specialty crop growers using organic, regenerative, no, or low spray weed management methods have voiced their need for decision management tools specific to weed management on their farms. Terry and I received specialty crop block grant funding to address this need by identifying the top five weed species of concern for farms not using herbicides, develop decision-making resources for these five identified weeds, provide ecology-based weed management trainings, provide resources online, and evaluate OMRI-approved herbicides for weed management. We conducted an online survey of the target audience to help us identify these priority weed species. The top five species were yellow nut sedge, Canada thistle, large crabgrass, hairy gallon soga, and smooth and red root pigweed. These weed species are the focus of our decision tool fact sheet publications and recorded presentations like this one. Pigweed germination takes place once soils reach 86 degrees with continued germination throughout the summer months. Flowers are developed in clusters at the leaf stem joints and branch ends, and they begin forming once the days begin to shorten after the summer solstice passes in late June. Redroot and smooth pigweed can be often found growing together in fields, and both of these pigweeds have hairy stems and can be very difficult to distinguish from each other. Mature pigweed plants have a short taproot and can grow to be up to six feet tall. Flowering and seed production will take place throughout the summer and fall until the first heavy frost. Pigweed spreads through seed, which can survive in the soil for about two years depending on the depth in the soil. Individual plants can produce tens of thousands of seeds, making this a very difficult plant to eradicate if plants are continuing to produce seed during the production season. Smooth and red root pigweed thrive in environments where there is a lack of competition from crops that allow for full sun environments, bare grounds, which allow for unimpeded growth, low management perennial cropping systems where there's little cultivation, mowing, soil disturbance, and space for the pigweed to grow, lack of soil disturbance at the seedling roots, and ample nitrogen and phosphorus that supports its rapid growth and maturity. So, so Meredith, yeah, that's, we have quite a few good pictures right here to really separate the two species because they're very similar. Both species have uh, oval to egg-shaped leaves with wavy margins, so very, very similarly, similarly for both redwood and smooth pigweed. Um, both species are, have airy stem, um, and that's quite a difference compared to other pigweeds that we can find in, eventually in New Jersey. Uh, for example, if we are looking at Palmer amaranth, another species of pigweed which is uh, becoming more problematic in New Jersey, Palmer amaranth is completely airless. Uh, if you're looking at the stem, there is absolutely no earth on the stem of Palmer amaranth. But both redwood and smooth pigweed uh, will have this airy stem. So unfortunately, the best time for making really the difference between the two species uh, is really when they start farming their seed head. Uh, redwood tend to have uh, uh, branches on the seed head uh, that are compact and short and stubby. Uh, that's what you see on a on the left picture on the right side of the screen. Uh, whereas smooth pigweed, uh, I mean, the seed head tend to have, uh, tends to have many branched uh, flower head uh, with branches that are longer on thinner than for redwood. So you can see that it's really a more compact seed head for uh, redwood pigweed. It's a more open seed head for smooth pigweed. And I said, unfortunately, because at this stage, making the difference between the two species is already useless because they're already too big. It's already forming seeds. So that's why in this presentation, um, because we are talking weed management on weeds to be needs to be managed uh, uh, at the seeding stage, uh, that's why it's quite useless to make the difference between the two species because uh, they will 
both react to the to management practices the same way uh, when when you when uh, when you try to control them. So smooth and red root pigweed thrive in environments where there's a lack of competition from crops that allows for full sun environments, bare ground allowing for unimpeded growth low management perennial cropping systems where there is little cultivation, mowing, or soil disturbance, a lack of soil disturbance at seedling roots, and ample nitrogen and phosphorus to support its rapid growth and maturity. Smooth and red root pigweed growth can be slowed by dense shading, so right, increasing that crop planting density to um, increase the amount of shade that would go over the, the weeds. Stale seed bedding that's followed by flame weeding or light cultivation that's no deeper than one inch in depth within two weeks of an oil, initial soil preparation. So the idea is you prepare your planting beds fertilizing, you're doing all the things you would do to get ready to, to either direct seed or transplant into these spaces, then uh, tarping for at least one week, <clears throat> removing that tarp, looking for this flush of weed uh, seedling growth, and then coming through with a flame weeder or doing this light cultivation, um, and then following through with either direct seeding or transplanting into that space. And on Meredith, it's, it's really important that uh, when you do your second cultivation for killing the seedlings that have emerged, it's really important to do it very lightly. You don't want to get too deep. Um, the reason is that if you're getting too deep, you will bring back at the surface of the soil um, weed seeds that were deeper in the soil on, because you do this cultivation on, because many weed seeds uh, will uh, react to cultivation by germinating. If you're bringing back seed from deep in the soil, uh, actually you can increase the problem instead of killing uh, emerge seedlings. So be very careful about this second cultivation. If you do decide to do cultivation, make sure you really don't get deeper than one inch deep. Um, so you are not bringing back seed at the surface of the soil. Okay, and so I think to yeah, adjusting equipment to make sure that you're really truly getting that shallow cultivation happening with whatever it is that that they're using, um, right? So the goal is to really unroot those young seedlings. So to bring the roots of those seedlings to the surface where they'll dry out and die. Um, another option is hilling up about an inch of soil on top of emerged seedlings in in crops where um, that could tolerate this type of hilling. So uh, sweet corn, potatoes, tomatoes, cabbage, squash would all be examples of crops that can withstand having the, the hilling taking place at the base of the plant. Uh, implementing two to three years of dense cover cropping to really force that, that competition of the pigweed species. Deep plowing, which results in the burial of seeds, but also has the flip side of what seeds are you bringing up to the surface. Uh, and then utilizing black plastic, landscape fabric, or thick natural mulches, really to suppress those, those seedlings from germinating. Mary, just uh, two comments regarding, um, you know, what, what can really uh, provide some control of, of pigweed. The first comment is that you really need to do this cultivation, this unrooting of young seedlings. You need to do it when the seedlings are really young uh, because pigweed have uh, unfortunately a bad tendency to, uh, to grow back uh, roots from the stem when the stems are already big enough. Uh, and sometimes you may have the feeling that you're cultivating, that you're killing the plant, but they may be already well advanced you know, the plant may be well, already well developed on actually you will have roots, especially if you have nice condition, if you're getting humidity, if you're getting nice temperature, this pigweed can develop roots on the stem uh, if the stem is directly uh, in the ground. So sometimes uh, if the plant is already too old, that will not help you to do that, to do this cultivation. So really the unrooting of young seedlings needs to be done when the seedlings are young. Um, on the, the last comment, and I think I made the same comment last time when we were discussing uh, 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 crabgrass, uh, deep plowing 
uh, is really a good strategy. But again, it's not a strategy that you want to do each year uh, because uh, when you do it once, by burying the seeds, the wheat seeds deeper, you're also increasing their survival in the soil because they are less exposed to uh, predation, they are less exposed to uh, uh, degradation by by microorganisms or uh, by by you know by environmental condition. So really, when you do this deep plowing, yes, do it. But uh, you, next time you want to do a deep plowing, maybe five years or six years from from the first time you did it, because you don't. If you start to do it every year, you will just bring back to the surface uh, seeds that uh, you have been burying the previous year on seeds that have been surviving, um, that have improved survival uh, deeper in the soil. So. Uh, just be careful with that. Uh, last thing is really the, 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 natural, the natural mulch. Uh, pigweeds are really, uh, they really don't like uh, this mulch. And, and really, uh, when you can do, when you can have, when you can have cover crop, or if you want to put a layer of, of you know, uh, straw or wh whatever, you know, wh whatever material you, you may want to use as a mulch, uh, pigweed are not reacting well to that. They, they really don't like, I mean, they, they if you're providing shading, if you're preventing a physical barrier at the surface of the soil, uh, pigweed will really stop emerging. So that's that's a good strategy for controlling pigweeds. So some cropping considerations for farms that have smooth and red root pigweed populations. So we want to scout early in the season for detection of those seedlings because the sooner that you can get um, to disturbance with these seedlings, the earlier it is, or the easier it is going to be um, to, to manage them. And thinking too with that early season scouting, right, that's, that's a great time to think about the strategies that you've planned over the winter months um, and maybe recalibrate those, those strategies based on what you're seeing across the farm. If you're using cultivation, um, and think about planting crops that can handle that repeated cultivation um, that you might be planning on doing at their roots. Right? Some crops are more tolerant of that than, than others. Think about how often you're going to cultivate or where on the farm you would implement cultivation, where and how often hand weeding would need to take place or if you want to use weed whacking and mowing during the season when maybe these other more um, time consuming activities are, are harder to, to get to, right? So that weed whacking and mowing is a way to disrupt flowering and seed production while not killing off the, the plant itself. Um, use cover crops that can become mulches when, when they're terminated and make sure your cleaning equipment to prevent uh, spread of seed across the farm and think about implementing these methods for several years. And I think I, I skipped over that stale seed bedding, which we talked about earlier. And Meredith, on, on, on I think something to, to keep in mind with pigweeds in general is that they really have this capacity to produce a huge amount of seeds. You know, I mean, you're talking about tens of, tens of thousands of seeds for a red root or smooth pigweed. Um, you know, when you're dealing with palmer amaranth, palmer amaranth has been shown to produce up to 500,000, up to a million seeds per, per plant. So you're, it's really a lot of seeds. So it's even more critical with this kind of weeds that are producing a lot of seed to stay really on the top in terms of managing plants that are blooming, to really make sure that you can mow, you can weed whack uh, before these plants start producing uh, um, seeds that, are, that can germinate later. So it's really, uh, you know, you may not have be successful all the time um, preventing, uh, you know, killing the young seedlings, but at least later in the season, make sure you're not replenishing the seed bank by really taking care of uh, blooming uh, pigweeds. Because all that, <clears throat> all that monitoring is really important, right? And and if you've got employees at the farm. Make sure they know they know what what your priority weed species look like too, and, and what stages do they do they become really concerning, um, right? Preventing that that seed from forming. So really try to get everybody on your team involved with this. Uh, it'll it'll make it easier in the long run rather than it relying on just one person to. Yeah, to I, 
I totally agree with that, Meredith. It's uh, we we have a tendency in weed science sometimes to uh, underestimate scouting uh, for for uh, weed detection, but it's really critical to do it because um, you know the more timely you can be when you want to uh, to kill a weed, the more successful you will be. Uh, um, you know, it's really it's really critical to think that when during the season uh, you may have a period of uh, rain, you may have a few thunderstorms during the season, and usually within a few days uh, you may have a flush of uh, pigweed emergence when you have this kind of condition. Uh, right now in New Jersey, I mean, we got a dry season, so we didn't see a lot of pigweed emergence, not at all actually, uh, during the last uh, four weeks. Uh, but we got rain this week, and I'm sure that next week, when we'll be looking at our uh, at our research plot, we'll start to see a lot of pigweed emerging uh, pretty next week. And one thing we haven't talked about is is that right. So so pigweed seedlings that are emerging now, right, that are flushing out because of the the rain we had. When would you expect to see flowers and and then ultimately seed production on those plants? Is, is the window wide enough now for them to be able to produce it, seed? Yes, I, I, would, I would think so, Marie, because what is amazing with some of these pigweed is that they don't need to be uh, extremely tall for producing seeds. Actually, uh, we have seen, um, you know, in, uh, in greenhouse, uh, in some of our uh, greenhouse experimentation, we have seen really small pigweed, uh, just five, six inches tall, uh, starting to produce uh, a seed head. So it will not be a lot of seed. Definitely to this one will not be producing a lot of seeds. But even at this time of the year, mid-August, mid you can still expect to get germination and they will still have time in September uh, to, to grow and produce uh, seeds. Uh, on, and they will die, I mean, you know, they, they will die with the first frost. So by, by October, most of them should be dying. But with you know, with germination occurring in in mid August, yes, yeah, there's still sufficient time for some of these plants to uh, to produce a decent amount of seeds uh, be, before before the first frost. Yeah. So it's it's a short window where if you saw them germinating maybe in late September, you'd be like you wouldn't have to worry about those plants so much. Yes, yes, but, yes. But um, now in in mid August, in the next couple of weeks, you still still need to focus on. Yeah, you still need to focus on, and you have some cropping system, you know, if, if you're talking about core crops, for example, uh, we, we are in the process right now, I mean, to transplant some, some cabbage on, on broccoli, for example. Yes, I mean, this plant, this small, uh, this small transplant can still be very sensitive to any kind of competition coming from pigweed that are germinating right now, because uh, pigweed will grow faster than the crops that you're transplanting at this time of the year, definitely. Yeah, and the ability to get to six feet tall that can quickly crowd out a lot of our crops that are yes, grown. indeed, indeed. Well, the ones that are germinating now may not be six feet tall. You know, they may be a little bit smaller. But I, I, I think that as soon as you know the plant is um, feeling that you know the day the day length is shortening, uh, mm -hmm. the plant may be switching to a. Uh, uh, to seed production relatively rapidly. So they're probably not getting as tall as the one that germinated earlier in the season, but they still have a, a, a big capacity to produce a, a decent number of seeds. All right, so we have prioritized farm activities that can be done in each season in order to reduce uh, and remove smooth and red root pigweed populations from certain production areas. Um, and as a reminder, it, these activities need to be repeated for two or more years based on the populations you have at your farm and the success of, of these management strategies that, that you're implementing, right? And But as the longer you implement these strategies and the fewer seeds that are produced on your farm, right, the shorter the window that you have um, these, these pigweed species germinating in, in your field. So we're gonna go over each one of these by season. So during the, the winter, right, we want to focus on where are the, these populations on the farm um, and thinking about the crops that you're going to be planting in, in these areas. Um, are these crops forgiving of some of the strategies that, that you'd like to implement 
during the season? Are they creating environments where these pigweed species can thrive? Or are these densely cropped um, areas that are going to be better at suppressing these pigweed populations? And we know crop rotation, there's a lot of factors uh, that go into crop rotation plans, um, what's planted where, when, uh, what weeds fit into that decision-making process as, as well. Um, also thinking about what you've implemented in the past to manage weeds. Have they produced meaningful results? Are they worth the time and effort um, based on the results that, that you're actually seeing? Um, and so there might be strategies that you've tried that aren't worth it, right? That you scrap those and you say that that's not working for me. Um, look back at this list that we're providing and think about what else could potentially be successful in managing populations. Um, also thinking about the locations of pigweed over the years on your farm. Is it everywhere? Or is it in very specific areas? Has that changed? Has, has that area spread over time? Um, have any of your management practices impacted other weed species on the farm, right? So sometimes when you, when you manage one weed, right, you create a, a niche there where another one can survive. And we see that, I feel like I see that a lot with purslane. Uh, because that's a, a more difficult one to control and it seems to do well in, in spaces where others don't. Um, and then think about your equipment uses and pathways on the farm, right? Is your equipment a source of, of seeds? So it, can you connect any spread of pigweed throughout your farm based on how equipment's used, right? So simply just even hosing off the soil from equipment when you're, you're moving it around the farm um, is can be an effective way of significantly reducing the amount of weed seeds that that are on the equipment. So your springtime activities should be focused on disturbing the seedlings, as we've been talking about, uh, and preventing emergence through the use of of cultivation, weed hand weeding, mowing, weed whacking tilling of the soil on top of pigweed seedlings, tarping, um, scale seed bedding, mulching, and, and dense cover cropping. So a lot, of, a lot of activities can be done based on the crops you're growing, the area of the farm, and, and what works for you with, with management. So your summer activities should continue on from the spring, right? Since we know that pigweed is going to continue to germinate from the spring into the summer and, and the fall as the temperatures <laughs> allow, uh, right? But the goal is disrupting these young seedlings and preventing mature plants from producing seeds. So that this includes the monitoring, right? Keeping your eyes open to, to where, where these seedlings are emerging keeping track of, of any changes that you've noticed or things that stand out to you that are different from years past. Um, we do, we have seen that field trials have shown that using tarps during the warmer days of summer can kill these young seedlings. So if you have a flush of growth, you can use tarps um, for leaving them out for at least a week. Certainly want to check in on them, see what's going on underneath the tarp, uh, but that can be used to kill the pigweed seedlings. Uh, then the amount of time really will depend on the temperatures that, that are happening in the environment at that time. Research has shown that tarping will not kill off seeds that have not yet germinated in the soil. So it's really the tarping's focused on killing off young seedlings. We talked about um, tarping also being used for that stale seed bedding, uh, right? So getting, getting a flush of growth going there killing off some and then coming through and, and cleaning up with flaming um, and that very shallow cultivation as Terry talked about earlier. Um, and so one of the resources that we've that we found um, that we really like is from the University of Maine. It's called Tarping in the Northeast, a guide for, for small farms. It's a reference that we include um, in our companion fact sheet that, that goes with this presentation. Um, so it's linked in that fact sheet uh, but it's also easily found if you just do an internet search. If you if you look up University of Maine and tarping in the Northeast, uh, there aren't very many publications out there available on this topic. So it's it's easy to find online and it's free and downloadable um, 
online. So it's a great resource that, that we think would be helpful to farms in the region. Um, and then lastly, uh, summer planting of dense cover crops in areas that are not currently in production, right? So don't create an open environment for pigweed to, to really thrive. Uh, so cover crops, summer cover crops such as rye or buckwheat could, could be used to help suppress the growth and, and reduce the reproduction of, of pigweeds during the summer. On merit, it's regarding monitoring, I think it's uh, it's important to consider that you don't want just to focus on the field where you have the crop when you're monitoring uh, pigweed. Uh, you may also want to look at what's going on in, in the surroundings of the field, uh, especially because pigweed seed can easily travel on equipment. Um, when you're, you know, uh, when you're moving dirt from, from one part of the field to another section of the field, uh, you, you can move pigweed seed at the same time each time that you're, uh, you're driving somewhere. So it's important to consider that, uh, you know, pigweed uh, growing in, in surrounding of, of the field on, on eventually to, to mow them as well to prevent seed production because, uh, the, I mean, seed produced in the surrounding of the field in the neighborhood of the field can easily travel back within the field later. Um, so that, that's really important to consider that. Uh, on the last thing to Meredith that we didn't discuss it today, but, um, Based on our own research um, within the context of this grant, I mean, we, we evaluated different herbicides for, uh, for, for weed control, including pigweed. Uh, we had um, smooth pigweed growing at, uh, at Snyder, where we did this work of testing um, a few label um, organic herbicides. Uh, and actually, what, what is really clear is that these herbicides are strictly contact herbicides. Um, the most efficient one I think we tested was uh, was vinegar, a 20% solution of vinegar, if I well remember, Meredith. Yeah. Um, on, on this one, I mean, we, we observe some limited control, uh, meaning that if you're starting to have seedlings that are already at the two-leaf stage, uh, you will mostly get cosmetic injury. You may slow down the development of the plant, but... Uh, you may not be able to kill it. If you really want to kill the pigweed with this kind of herbicide, you really need to kill them uh, when they are the seedling stage. So when they are, when they are either the cotyledon stage or, or the one leaf, the first two leaf stage, uh, maybe it's a good time to really kill them with this kind of herbicide. But uh, the, the, you know, the, the older the plant, uh, the less effective it will be to use this herbicide for controlling pigweeds. All right, so going into fall, we're gonna see the summer activities that you were doing that were really focused on that seed formation to continue on during the fall months through through your first really hard frost, um, right? So just still on that prevention of seed production. So monitoring, right? Keeping your eyes open, looking around, where is where are the more mature, um, pigweed plants and whether it's hand roguing them out uh, or coming through with the weed whacker, um, mowing, right, dense cover cropping, right, all those things can come into play. Uh, but really, I think that that hand weeding, weed whacking and mowing is, is critical for those areas um, to really make sure that you're preventing those plants from going to, to seed. Um, the fall is also a great time to sort of jot down some notes about things you would want to consider when you're planning crop rotations and weed management activities uh, during the winter months, right? It's easy to, to, to have lots of things in your head during the season. Um, and then when you need to recall it all in the winter, that's a tall order. So, um, so jotting down some notes about what worked and didn't work um, and some, some thoughts about that can, can be helpful. So farmers should base their management decisions when controlling smooth and red, red root pigweed um, on their monitoring observations and reflections of what they've done in the past. Um, making sure that we're managing the, the growth of smooth and red root pigweed before it goes to seed each year will only lessen the amount of work that has to happen trying to control this, this weed species in the future. Um, so the fact that it remains viable in those top parts of the soil for only two years is, is a good thing. And so really aggressive control of seed production can have a big impact on, on the weed population on the farm. Um, and thankfully, 
management of, of our common annual weed species that are, uh, that are found here in New Jersey, right? There's some similar management options. If you've listened to our other presentations, there's some repetition here of, of activities. So when you're, when you're impacting one, you're probably impacting others and that's a good thing. Um, so, right, when we're thinking about, about making decisions about management in the future, right, we're asking those same questions over and over again. So being mindful of those populations um, and, and continually thinking about that future plan, not just the short term, but the long term plan on how we're going to manage them. So to review, the earlier you start management of smooth and red root pigweeds on a farm, the smaller the population you'll have to deal with in the future. The methods that you use may vary over time, but the key goal is preventing those seeds from being produced and dispersed across the farm. So some key management strategies that we've talked about today are use growing season long cultivation, hand weeding, mulching, weed whacking, and mowing to prevent plant maturity. Use stale seed bedding prior to planting your crops. Plant short season crops with rapid rotations that allow you to manage seedling emergence through cultivation. Create competition by using taller crops in infested areas and cover cropping to prevent bare ground spaces. And employ equipment cleaning procedures to not spread seed across the farm. Carrie, do you have any final thoughts? Um, no, I mean, you summarize it, you summarize it very well, Meredith. It's, it's really that, yes, I mean, you, you, you need to do this monitoring, this scouting really, uh, thoroughly for, for really getting some good control of pigweed. Uh, again, it's not a weed that will be germinating at just one single point during the season. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, you can have germination up to early September uh, easily with some of these big weed species. So just stay on the top of monitoring and when you start to see uh, that, that you're starting to get a, a flush of emergence, uh, make sure you're, you're preparing your equipment uh, for, for controlling the pig weed uh, relatively soon after emergence. Well, thanks, Terry. I think this was a great discussion and overview today of pigweed and hopefully participants learned a few new things um, and feel maybe a little more energized to, um, to start managing the populations and certainly seed production of, of pigweeds on, on their farm. So as a reminder, you can view presentations on our other priority weed species on our weed management YouTube page, which is accessible through the QR code that you see here. Uh, decision tool fact sheets are also posted with each companion video in the description portion of the video and on the Rutgers NJAES publication website. Each resource will be published once they are completed and all should be available by September 30th, 2022. This project was funded by the USDA Specialty Crop Block Grant, and we are appreciative of, of the funding support of this project. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>